Hola, Buenos Aires. We come from a really small country in, uh, in Europe, Norway, so we are so excited yeah. to be invited and meet so many cool people from all over the world. Yes. yes. Thank you, Media More, for this. Yes. And uh, we're going to talk about SCUM. Uh, I'm the writer and director. Um, yeah, and I'm the web producer, and we both work at uh, the NRK, Norway's public broadcaster. So now we're going to show you just a clip. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was the trailer for season three of Scum. Uh, we are going to try to explain to you what Scum is, first and foremost. I don't know how many of you uh, know about the show, so we will s start from the beginning. Yeah, so Scum is a drama series that runs daily online through this web page. And it's told through clips. Uh, which can last from one minute or 20 minutes through text screenshots of text messages between the characters and also on different social media platforms. And new content can drop any time. You never know when new content is being published on our web page uh, and it runs in real time, which means if something happens in a story Friday night, 9.30, we will publish that content Friday night, 9.30. And if it's Christmas here, it's Christmas there. Yeah. So they have the same date as we do. So this, this is an example of one week of content published at our web page. So you see in the morning on Saturday, we published a clip. This is from season four. And then during the afternoon, uh, there was more content, but, uh, screenshots between the characters. And as well, Sunday, they only got one, we only published one clip, and then on Monday there was two clips, and so it goes on through the week. And this is what we publish on a web page, but we also create stories on different platforms. So during this week, we published content on uh, different uh, Instagram accounts from the characters' fictional uh, accounts, and also YouTube and Instagram, and you see this Friday, the last clip is a, from a party. Uh, and that all the characters attended. And they shared pictures from that party in real time. Yes. But Scum is also created so you can watch it as a traditional drama show, which is we edit every clip from one week together as one conventional episode that we, you can watch on demand or on linear TV but it's mainly created for and customized for the daily experience. Yeah, and a digital platform. Yeah. Yes, and um, 
Most people ask us how we, we came up with this idea of doing a show in real time. Uh, I often describe the show as a, as a mix between a drama series and a blog, and that's because it started... I'm sorry. Yeah, you do. Hope it's over. No. Okay, we're going to talk about the seasons. I'm sorry, I jumped. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, we did four seasons of Scum, uh, and uh, every season uh, switches perspective. So the first season is the story of Eva uh, as the main character. She has an emotional journey that season, but then the next season, uh, her best friend Nora is the main character. Uh, so we did four seasons. Uh, every season had a different character and different journey, and it starts at the first semester of high school. Yeah. So we we have created this show in Norway, as we said. Uh, Norway is a really small country. It's only five million people in the world talking Norwegian. And uh, our target group is approximately 30,000 people in Norway, cause, cause, because our target group is 16-year-old girls. Very small country. Yeah. So, But something has happened with SCUM. Um, Something happened in Brazil. Uh, there's a fan group on Facebook in Brazil with 86 members. Thousand. Thousand <laughs> members. And uh, on the last episode ever uh, in June of Scum, Scum was trending on Twitter globally under the hashtag Thank You Scum, where the fans were sharing stories of how Scum had impacted their life. And then also something crazy in China happened with 180 million views uh, on uh, Weibo, the Chinese YouTube. Yes. And we will try to explain. I think it's, it's many reasons why uh, Scum has reached so far out of its own target group. We will try now to explain why we think that happened or at least give you some reasons for it. Many people ask how uh, it started. Uh, and as I, I was about to say earlier, uh, SCUM hasn't been developed overnight. Uh, we started at NRK in 2008 um, uh, with a show that was a fictional video blog for a 12-year-old girl. So the girl uh, was a character, everything was written but she would uh, tell her story online to the viewers through webcams and blogging uh, and pictures. Uh, and then at some point we started adding um, small scenes and clips, uh, fictional scenes. Um, and uh, it was such a great success that we made a new show called Mia in 2010. It was the same concept, only we had three different characters blogging on the same page. And that didn't really work. It was really messy because it was hard to understand the story. Uh, so we made a new attempt in 2013, Yente, which is still running at NRK. It's in its 10th season. Uh, and this time they were blogging. They were talking to the viewers through webcam. We had fictional scenes, but we switched characters from season to season, just like Scum. Um, and this show was such a great success. Um, it reached also 15-year-olds and 16-year-olds. And at NRK, it had been a saying, um, for as long as I've been working there, that teenagers are impossible to reach. So NRK uh, didn't make anything for teenagers for 20 years because they didn't think it was possible to, to reach them. But because we could see that the teens were watching in on this tween show, uh, then NRK said, okay, maybe we should try to make something for them. Yeah. So SCUM is based on the experience from these productions, but also uh, from, based on an eight-month comprehensive research. 
We did a lot of research. I think we spent hundreds of hours stalking teenagers on their social media accounts. We stalked them at the schoolyards. Yeah, we were really them stalking them. It was <laughs> creepy. But, uh, and we also conducted 50 depth interviews uh, with boys and girls between 15 and 19 years year old yeah. teens. And uh, we uh, at NRK and also me and Mari like to use a method called NABC. I'm not sure if any of you have heard about it, but it's, I think it was uh, developed in San Francisco uh, for tech companies. And what the med method does is that it says instead of going out and gathering a lot of data and statistics, instead you just find one representative in the target group and you interview that person trying to find a need, something they need. And then you meet that need with a show or a tech thing or whatever. Um, but uh, the whole idea is finding a need. Um, and we didn't just find one representative. As Mari said, we interviewed many, but we were uh, looking for a need. Uh, in the target group. Um, and uh, I think the, the, the need we ended up with choosing, I think we knew about this need, it's pretty obvious and it's kind of like a boring need <laughs> because everybody knows this. Uh, but we ended up with it uh, after doing research um, because we could see that the teens today are under a really big pressure of being perfect. Uh, they want to be perfect uh, in school, they want to be perfect on so uh, social media, in sports, everywhere. So the question we asked was, is it possible to make a show that can take away some of that pressure? Um, and when we, um, when we started to work on that, we found that, okay, so if we could give them tools like humor and the ability to uh, laugh about yourself and self-irony, uh, that could help because uh, if uh, instead of feeling like a failure, you could laugh, that takes away some of the pressure. So that was one of the things we knew that we wanted to try to give them with this show. Uh, also, uh, we wanted to show them how human interaction work, uh, how everybody has their own concerns. Because when you're 16 and you, for example, get rejected by a boy, it feels like there's something wrong with you when it doesn't necessarily have to have anything to do with you. Uh, so we wanted to show them how everybody has their own story and their own life and their own shit to deal with. Um, also, uh, the third thing we, we found that we wanted to try to, to give them was, or to show them the value of facing fear. That if you confront your, your problems and you face your fear, uh, it builds confidence. So that was the three main things we ended up uh, deciding to try to give them. And we put that into a miss mission statement. Yeah, which is the core mission with our show. And it so is like this. SCUM aims to help 16-year girls strengthen their self-esteem through dismantling taboos, making them aware of interpersonal mechanism, and showing them the benefit of confronting their fears. So and we measure everything we do, even in, in season four when, when people started to watch, uh, watching in from all over the world, we would go back to this mission statement. And every time we, we were making a choice, we would measure it up to this sentence saying, is this the best for 16-year-old mm -hmm. girls and is this what we're doing with this show? And for the whole concept we are yeah, yeah. measuring with this. And uh, through the research, we found that our biggest competition towards this teenager was the big budget drama series from the US, YouTube, Facebook, which is hard to compete with. 
yeah. with this tiny production we had. Yeah, because when we asked them, what do you watch today? They would say Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad. Or and Modern we'll... Family and all these big shows. But this was our strength because we knew where they were coming from. We knew their references. Uh, we knew their cultural environment. And we could use that to... Reach, create them. Some, reach them and create something they could identify with and that felt authentic. Yeah. So uh, we knew that we had to have really strong identification. Uh, we used that research also in, in uh, building characters. Uh, actually, uh, I uh, talked to... Uh, in my research interviews, I talked to a 17-year-old Muslim girl and I asked her di directly, what do you want to see if, if I were to create a character that was going to represent you? What do you want to see? And she said, um, can you please try to make a strong, independent Muslim girl that is not suppressed by society or social control? Um, and then I made a character called Sana, which is the girl in the middle here. And we're going to see uh, a scene with Sana. Uh, I just have to try to explain something to you first, because we have this very weird tradition in Norway. Um, every um, When students finish high school, they have a celebration in May. Uh, and what they do is that groups of 20, 25 students buy a bus together, like a, like a real bus. And then they dress it, uh, and then they drive around in that bus for a month drinking. And partying. <laughs> and partying. In suits and hats. So, yeah. And I had no idea why the Nor <laughs> people of Norway or the government allows this. It's just a tradition. <laughs> That goes on every year, and nobody, because everybody has been what we call Rus, so they just... Yeah, and this planning for this graduation party starts already three years ahead. In, yeah, it starts in the first grade. The, yeah, the moment you high start school. high school, you try to find a group, and you start pl planning for this. So, so this, this scene we're going to see is the uh, meeting between these five girls. They just started high school and they have found each other and they're having their first Rusebus Yeah. And sorry for your yeah, translation. Yeah, I just have to say, can I please say to the translator, uh, this is a scene in Norwegian, but it's texted in English. And I hope you can follow and translate in Spanish, even though the dialogue is, is fast really, at really times. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Og vi har en veldig stor fordel i forhold til de andre bussene, og det er at jeg allerede har kjøpt inn et veldig stort Dorul-parti. Vil du klare det å kjøpe Dorul for 40 000 kroner på kredit til en annen buss? I hvert fall så kommer vi til å sitte igjen med en fortjeneste på 60 000 kroner. Så jeg laget et budsjett, og dette budsjettet, det tar utgangspunkt i at dere tjener 50 000 kroner ved siden av Dorolsalget. Mm. Så jeg trenger at alle dere har en selvstendig plan for hvordan dere tjener de resterende pengene. Mm. Er det noe? Vi kaster bort tiden på dette Dorolmaset. Det hjelper ikke å ha budsjett når vi ikke har nok folk på bussen. Det er faktisk ganske viktig å ha oversikt over økonomien. Hør nå, vi er de største loserne på skolen. Og med mindre dere vil at vi skal ende opp i en loservan, så må vi ha en strategi. Vi er ikke de største loserne på skolen. Ble ikke du nettopp kastet av en annen buss? Jeg ble ikke direkte kastet ut. Du ble jo det. Hør nå, Hilde. Det blir veldig vanskelig for meg å jobbe med deg om du skal være helt i fornøktelse. Kan du ikke bare innse at vi er losere? Synes du selv at du er en loser, da? Hallo, jeg er en muslimsk jente i dette hvite, troløse landet. Jeg er den største loseren av alle. Du snakker skikkelig voksent. Takk. Men hva er poenget da? Hva er det du vil at vi skal gjøre? Jo, aller først må vi skaffe flere jenter til bussen. Kule jenter. Og hvordan får vi til det? Spørre dem. Feil. Vi spør ingen. De kule jentene skal spørre oss. Men aller først må vi skaffe oss noe vi ikke har. Et ord på fire bokstaver. 
Spenn. Kred. Spenn er fem bokstaver, Chris. Kjenner vi noen av 90-20-guttene? Ok, da må vi finne ut hvem av 90-20-erne som har den beste bussen, komme oss på et bussvors og skaffe rulleplasser. Noen idé om hvordan vi skal få til det, da? Dere må hukke med dem. Er du seriøs? Dere? Ja, jeg hukker ikke. Ok, så vi skal hukke, men hva er det du skal bidra med? Kødder du med meg? Her sitter jeg og redder i tafatte Dorul-møte med en strategisk velfungerende plan, og så lurer du på hva jeg skal bidra med. Har du noe av dere kjæreste? Jeg har. Hvor gammel er han, da? 19 år. Dum pann. Ja, du er ikke seriøs nå. Hun er den peneste av alle her. Det er bortkastet hvis hun går rundt og har kjæreste. Men... Ærlig talt, det er helt rullig det. Hva da? Men du kan ikke sitte her og be oss om å bytte ut seksualiteten vår mot kredd. Du er gæren. Nei, jeg er ærlig. Jenter i Norge bytter sex mot penger, popularitet og bekreftelse hver eneste dag. Det kan hende at du ikke er enig i verdiene bak det. Det er ikke jeg heller. Men du kan ikke sitte her og late som om det er helt nytt for deg. Det er din kultur. Så hvis du synes den er så gæren, så foreslår jeg at du går ut og prøver å endre på den, enn å sitte her og kritisere. Men det er jo litt drøyt at du ber Eva om å slå opp med kjæresten din. Det var et forslag. Hvis hun er så glad i kjæresten sin, så regner jeg med at det veier tyngre enn hva jeg sier. Hun kan tenke selv, hun er ikke et barn, liksom. Jeg tror dette blir bra, jeg. Det var... Det var den bedre Sana. Så det var... Sana. Vi også brukte alle research vi gjorde i å bygge storylines. Og noen av de historiene som teens fortalte meg under research, jeg ville putte i skriftene. Um, we're going to see a scene from this um, um, from the school, uh, and it's based on a story um, a girl told me. Uh, she, in the first semester of high school, had a boyfriend. Uh, they had had a, a big fight, and she was at a party. And at this party, she kissed another guy. Uh, and then, right after she kissed this guy, his girls girlfriend walks in. So it's complicated because she has a boyfriend and he has a girlfriend. And when his girlfriend finds out that he have been kissing her, it's a confrontation in the schoolyard. To, to tell it very easy. Uh, but um, also I want to say something about how we, we produce it uh, because Uh, this school, Nissen uh, School in Oslo, is a real school, uh, so it has the same name. Um, and every uh, extra in this scene and in every scene is real students at this school. So we tried to mix uh, reality with fiction to make it more true and to also let, because our target group, as we said, was really small, 30,000, most of the students in Oslo and also in other cities in Norway know about this school. Um, so the identification uh, is uh, high. Mm. But in this scene we're going to see, every, every extra in the picture is actually real students. And another reason we have to work like this is because we produce we're not going to get into production because that's a whole yeah. new presentation, <laughs> but, but we can say that we produce two episodes on three days. So this scene we're going to see here, I made in 50 minutes.
Ja, men så seriøst, jeg må faktisk ikke. Jeg har vært sent som sju på en mye. Hvis jeg skal. Fy faen, jeg kommer bare til å få fett over her. Ja, det var ikke helt fint. Så det var for deg? Ja, 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 helt for meg. Så bra. Uansett så er det ingen som bryr seg om det som skjedde med meg. Hvem alle tenker på er ikke som bare en kvitt. Hva? Hva slik det går om Chris? Chris hukket min mor på Halloween-festen, og da må jeg samle ut og klikke av meg søy på. Men du så ut som et kjebak, Chris. Chris hukket min mor på Halloween-festen, jo. Jeg så det. Du så det? Vi var på trappa. Takk, ja. So, so there's not much blocking. Uh, we use uh, real people to make scenes like this, and we start real fights. No, not really, <laughs> but yes, almost. <laughs> yeah. Fun fact about this clip: we did, we actually just put it in the presentation today, and we didn't bring the clip to South America, but. Luckily, our fans are distributing scum through different Google Drives <laughs> and translates it on different fan, uh, no, different languages. Yeah, so thank you to the fans for, for doing the translating work on yeah. this. <laughs> okay, so um, in 2008, when Sara was created, the blog format was in its golden age because many 12-year-old girls use blog to express themselves on the internet. When creating a web drama show in 2015, that wasn't the uh, reality anymore. Um, no one were using blogs and we knew right away we can't continue with that tool, a storytelling tool. And I remember a girl told me, I'm 100% myself on Instagram, just a better version. Uh, which I think is kind of true for all of us. And it became obvious that social media should be integrated in the storytelling of SCUM uh, because of the digital identity is such a big thing among teenagers and everyone today. Uh, so in SCUM, almost every character has their own Instagram account or Facebook or YouTube. These platforms only because of production reasons, but all of these uh, accounts live 24 seven online during the whole season and sharing glimpses from their life. And also uh, we use uh, this to uh, tell different sides of the storylines. Um, they and get to know the characters. Also. Yeah, and yes. you get to know the character, and also it's a great promotional tool uh, because you know things spread during you no know, spreads on social media. And so, just like if you're scrolling down your Instagram feed, looking what your friends are doing, and then suddenly a picture of Vilde appears, or the girls uh, creates a identification to the characters. They become closer to you. And also cr producing it almost in re real time, we can be current. Like 
uh, use current events in the story, like the horrible terror attack in Manchester um, in, that happened during season four. We used that uh, on Sana, that season main character's um, Instagram. So, yes, and uh, I will try to explain you an example, an example of how we use social media in the real-time storytelling. So, you remember the clip we saw from the bus meeting, right? That was published Friday, uh, Friday evening, um, and the next day, uh, the next content we published on our webpage was in, on Saturday morning, where Eva, the main character, wakes up with her boyfriend, Jonas. But so, in the meantime, that evening, Jonas published this picture on his Instagram, uh, which is a reference to his best friend, Isaac. Uh, and under this picture, in the comment section, Isaac and Jonas starting to interact. Uh, and then Eva starts to interact with them. And during this conversation, Jonas and Eva uh, plans to meet up. Because he's asking, are you done with the meeting? And she says, yes, come over. And th those three characters are uh, interacting with each other in real time. But actually, it's, <laughs> oh, yeah. it's just us. Sitting Friday night. Which also is a bit creepy, because... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is some ethical line there I think we have crossed. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. yeah, so but also what, which, what the cool thing is that some of the followers are interacting with the characters. Just. And this is really early. Yeah, so, so early. You know, this is in the third season, no, third episode or third week in Scum. We only had like 20,000 unique users on a web page in one week. And this account only had like 300 followers. But we thought that we would make a unique experience for those maybe 10 people who would notice this interaction in the comment section, just to make them wonder if, is this real persons or fiction? Yeah. And then and have a reaction so strong that they would go to their friends and tell about the show. And this is so much fun doing, but we, can't, we couldn't do it anymore because it became too popular. But it's something we continuously try to find ways of how to like drag our audience into the universe and uh, yeah, and make them out. feel closer to the character, make them feel like the character is, is their real friends. Because in the first uh, concepts in the when we did in 2008 with the, with the blog, the character would speak directly to uh, the viewers. Uh, but we can't do that in Scum, except from moments like this, yeah. when they interact directly. We will show you some examples later. Um, but yeah, like I said, new content can drop anytime on our webpage um, at, uh, in Scum. And uh, there's no notification when uh, something is published, so the audience has the choice to interact or not. They have to actively go into the web page and see if something new has come. Um, and it's really easy to interact with Scum. You don't need a username or password. And if you comment or like any of the content, you're completely anonymously. Um, and the storytelling tools that we use in Scum helps and amplifies the audience identification to the characters and therefore it provokes engagement. So, in our comment sections, underneath every content we publish, they start hammering anonymously on the keyboards, sharing all their emotional reactions, theories and predictions of the show, discussing what's gonna happen, and the issues the characters are going through, and also asking questions I don't think they would dare to ask in real life. And this is the core mission of our show, to create, give them the opportunity to the, discuss um, the issues characters are going through together without uh, any one of us or the show telling them what is right and wrong. 
And as you probably noticed, we read everything in the comment section in our web page and try Almost to... Almost everything, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> and I try to read on all the fan, um, fan pages. Yeah. So it's a, like a constant focus group telling us when with their prediction and also like when we just did a lousy job. Yeah. And we used their reactions for the benefit of the show because our audience are so aware that we read them, read their comments, and because sometimes we answer them. Yes. So we have some examples on how. Okay. Season two, uh, there's a big love story between the feminist Nora and the douchebag William. Uh, they have been struggling, they just had a fight. Uh, but Nora, she has fight her feelings towards William because he's the biggest... Yeah, she didn't like him in the beginning. No. Uh, and now she but, likes him. Yeah, and she has finally declared uh, her love for him to all of her friends and the whole scum universe are ready to see them together. But there's a problem. William is missing in action. He won't reply or answer any of her calls and texts. And the community is flipping out, the characters are flipping out, just waiting, waiting, waiting for William to answer. And remember, this runs in real time, so we have to be with Nora, wait with her until William has answered. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> Yes. It became, it came... Yeah, it was people were going crazy. At NRK, people didn't work. They were just sitting, refreshing the scum page. Uh, they were analyzing together, like you do with your friends yeah. when a boy doesn't answer your text. <laughs> All of Norway was analyzing why William didn't answer. Yeah. I think this was the point we understood how huge, huge. scum had gotten uh, in Norway. Uh, because... Uh, also, uh, somebody made a page uh, saying, have William answered yet, dot no. And it would just say no, 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 no every time you <laughs> refreshed, uh, refresh until he did, and then it said yes. Yeah. And there was cell phone companies creating advertising, saying if William had use our company, he would have answered yeah. by now. So, so the, the whole country was just going insane. Yeah, completely insane. And, and also in our comment section. And there was one person writing this. I can't concentrate on my own exam until William has answered. So I copy pasted this line and gave it to Eva in a group chat between the girls where they were chatting about William, of course. So now Eva has the same emotion, the feeling, like our audience. So we, you know, the example of how the uh, reality and fiction interferes. And it, it's not important if it's fiction or it's reality. It's just we're all desperate to see William and Nora together. Yeah, and it's also how the real-time concept works. Yeah. They have to wait together for and this mirror, text. And mirror our audience. Yes. So, and finally... Yes. yes, he answered. He, he did answer. And they probably living happily together. Let's no hope one. so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, the next example. Yeah, because like we say, we, the, the, the fans try to communicate with us all the time. We almost never communicate directly uh, back to the fans. Uh, we, we talk almost to no press. We, we don't. Uh, put up messages on scum or we never uh, speak directly to them but we speak to them through the show and it was a discussion in season two also uh, because I love using cliches uh, in my directing I love slow motion uh, and this one character the William character he usually turns up in slow motion and that was, <laughs> that was fun the first time and also the second time. And then at some point the fans were like, isn't it like we've seen it? We, we've seen the slow motion. Like, are, are you going to do this forever? Um, and then we decided to comment on the slow motion. So we're going to see a scene with William and you should listen to the text of the song. The lyrics. The lyrics. The lyrics, yes. Men det er ikke på skolen i dag. Jeg har hørt at Chris fortsatt er på sykehus, liksom. Er ikke det begynnet til William? Det 
1985 white Lamborghini Countach, two of them. Can't be your only hustle Unless you bad as Naomi Russell I mean a lot of niggas got money So basically, Russell ain't the- Ta iyi bunu meremem daha var mı? Ama Yeah <laughs> So after that, they were okay with slow motion <laughs> because because we comment back to them and we used humor um, and I guess self irony, which is also like we told you earlier, what we're trying to give them. In yeah. Uh, during season three, uh, fan art became hugely popular to create in the fan community. And this picture is uh, created by the talented uh, um, fan artist Ellis Gum on uh, Instagram. In, and she drew this in the end of season three. And we got so many emails and hashtags about this uh, picture because our audience, they wanted to see uh, the main five uh, guy characters uh, in the same scene. Um, so, just let us know if you noticed something in the first scene of season four. Hi, Asya. Hi, Ferdi. Hi. Sorry, I'm Luka. I'm not going to be a good one. Yeah, I'm not going to be a good one. I'm not going to be a good one. I'm not going to be a Yeah. There you have them. Yes, so that's also a way of appreciating the fandom and telling them that we see them and hear them. And, and we, letting them make the show with us. I think yeah. from the start when we were doing this for we knew we... I've, I've, it's so many years since I was 16. Uh, and we need the target group to make the series yeah. with us. Uh, and that's what we tried to do. And we all, uh, often say that the community is scum. It's a whole, we're creating it together. And also, um, they are, the teenagers today have grown up digital. It's easy to be your own uh, broadcaster and uh, you, everyone has the possibility to be heard. Uh, so I think there is an expectation among our target group to be heard or to have an influence. And by doing this, we are, yeah, giving them uh, some, some uh, influence. Yes. We have tried to uh, sum it up. <laughs> okay, so as we started, uh, I, don't think, I don't think it's one or two or even four reasons that SCUM was a uh, success. I think it's maybe a hundred. Uh, but we tried to list some of them. Uh, so the first would be do the research and listen to your target group and take them seriously. And that's kind of like an obvious, um, an obvious statement, but uh, I think uh, it's, it's when I talk to the target group, I listen to the point that I, I, I make sure I know how it feels. Uh, so if they are telling me about the story or a worry or whatever, uh, I don't stop asking questions until I can feel it and relate totally and know what the person means. Because if a 16-year-old girl can feel it and I have felt it and know what it is, probably a lot of other people also has felt it. Uh, so uh, it will reach further. Um, and also, uh, talking to broadcasters and studios today, uh, they often talk about how to reach teens and how to get them. Uh, but uh, with changing the question 
until what you till what you can give them instead uh, maybe gives you a different result. Yeah. And also adapt to user behavior. I think that's been like uh, a point many of the speakers have been talking to and I, uh, talking about. And I think if Scum would have run for 10 seasons, it would look a lot different from season one to the 10th season. Because how we consume uh, content and uh, it, it's changing almost every day and it's changing so fast. And we have to adapt uh, on the user behavior, but also try to explore new ways of uh, cons consumation, but also like an, an experiment. Um, and the most important thing, I think, if it's a really good story, it will be seen. Even without, on linear television. Yeah, even on linear <laughs> television. So, have create great characters and good story. Um, yeah, it's what Damien said um, yesterday. He said that uh, the, the story is king and the yeah. platform is queen, right? Yes, we agree. Yeah, we agree. And uh, to the last, we want to quote Kanye West, listen to the kids bra. Thank you. Bravo. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you Chicas. so much. Girls, sit down. Please. Bueno, vamos a charlar un ratito. We okay. are going to have a little okay. chat. Eh, lo que decíamos ayer. What we said eh, yesterday at the beginning of Media Morphosis. And it's one of the concepts that is main, is that si content no is historia, king, and if there's no not a good story to tell, there's nothing. But the queen should be to understand the user habits. You are the perfect example for this, of this articulation between these two concepts. The truth is, it's so interesting how, by exploring, you managed to do that. We spoke yesterday with Ricardo, who's in charge of our communication, and told us, we talked a lot about what you do, and we realized that the success that makes it work in China, and there's 100 mil, mil, 80 million views, is the content. Because in China, they're not following it on social media. They're not living real time. So clearly, there is a story that moved people everywhere. There is a way that research that you did and the work that you did paid off. That is king. And in the innovation, and that's what's interesting about new technologies, how you were able to understand your audience. This happens in Norway because you have a team of 15 scriptwriters and 17 community managers. Or no? Or you don't? No, we don't. No. What do you mean? A series like this? You must have an enormous team. No, uh, we're a really small thing team. I think we're eight people. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I write um, all the scenes myself. Um, and then uh, what we do, I, I will write an episode uh, and then I will sit down with uh, Mari and we will talk about um, script. Yeah, talk about the script and also the 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 social media content. That yeah. So we will plan how to structure the week. Try to find which questions or storylines can we bring online to make it more intense for the daily users. So then I start to write uh, all the interactions for the, the online storytelling. Yeah. This is interesting because for our idiosyncrasy in our Argentine mindset, oh sorry, in our Argentine mindset, this is interesting to see here in Argentina, our mindset, we always imagine that big products are done by big teams with lots of people and that maybe there's 36 scriptwriters like in The Simpsons and huge teams and this is a very interesting example that it is perhaps the same kind of production team that we may have here. There is a concept and a way of working which is vital. 
So what I want to ask you is, are you working 24 hours on this product for the last four hours, 24-7? It is complete commitment, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, but yes, we've been uh, working 24 hours the past two years. Yeah. And uh, we often explain our job more or scum more than an uh, event than a, rather than a TV show. And it's like, because we're online 24-7, the characters are living, 20, existing 24-7. So it's just like, like we're here now on a stage and you have to adapt on how your audience are um, responding? responding on your performance. And also, I know you do and I do t uh, as well, like walking around, even though Eva isn't like in the main storyline for season four, I was always thinking, mm, what are Eva doing now? Just to be yeah. uh, on top <laughs> yeah. To, uh, yeah, in this universe. Bien, eh, I have so many questions. Eh, On the one hand, este sea maybe un, this is a new way of creating eh, creativo, a creative team for new content. Este this kind of scheme that you created nuevo. might be the new way. Before, we used to have a traditional uh, TV setup with uh, script writers, etc. But now, we may Cuando want to think of uh, teams like you have. When we spoke, uh, preparing this conference, you told me that chapters have irregular times. They don't always uh, last the same amount of time. Why is this so? It's, it's because the story decides how long a, a scene or a episode is going to be. Um, so because it's made for a digital platform, it doesn't really matter how long it is. Um, so we just try, because we're a really small production and we produce a lot during um, a season, we just try to be both economical uh, in the way we produce. So I, I know that for planning for, a, if I'm gonna have a party scene in an episode, then I know that I have to cut down on other scenes in that episode and that week because I don't have that much time to, to produce. Uh, so that also influences how long an episode will be and it doesn't matter because it's digital. It's digital and it also it's irrelevant if we would put like something that works on linear TV, like 30 minutes uh, drama series. That's, we don't need to have that on online. You can, and not like putting those traditional concept into the web because it's completely two different uh, platforms. Bien. Lo que creo que nosotros no tenemos tan claro es que el producto nació Okay, what I don't think is so clear for us is that the product was born on the web and abierta. from its success it went to open TV afterwards. That is why web irregular web times also shifted to open TV. Is that so? Yeah, so it, when, we <laughs> when we started producing this show, it was a really small show with a, a, a very low budget and nobody at NRK really cared what we did, which is a good thing because then you could do whatever you want. Uh, but, but suddenly uh, it, turned out to be a, a great success. And then the, the programmers at NRK wanted to put the show on linear television. Um, and we said, you, you can't really do that because it's made for a digital platform. And they said, yeah, but we want to we wanna send it. So then we had to say, yes, you, oh, you can have it, but it, like our shortest episode is 14 minutes. The longest is one hour. So, it, and we like, don't know that until we're finished in the editing room, which is, most, mostly is like just an hour before it airs yeah. the episode. So we had to like tell them, okay, you can you can show it, but we, f well, first of all, we can't give you uh, how many minutes it will last, and uh, second of all, you can't have it until like only an a couple of, mm, uh, an hour before we 
before theirs. Y porque era un éxito, aceptaron las condiciones. Porque and because it, and because it was a success, they Para accepted those terms and conditions because these are quite unique for uh, linear TV, right? Yeah, it, or actually they asked for it in the after three episodes of season one, and it wasn't a success then. So I think it's cool to see how. Uh, we have to like change our mindset on uh, on how to programming and about like especially like minutes. So the people who are programming at NRK were cool and open enough to um, experiment with this, and then they bought in all these uh, really short format that they would plan uh, for this time. They didn't know uh, if it was going to scum or. Yeah. So, uh, so I think so. Uh, like you usually say that even though it was difficult in the start for them, I think they were excited about yeah. the challenge also that they were. Yeah, because it's been changing the whole system at NRK, and I think on demand has been changing so much since Scum started, and uh, um, and yeah, it's just a, a big evolution uh, of how to distribute and publish. TV programs. Bien, y Scam está teniendo okay, ventas de formato. Scam, is Scam having a format sales? Will you be doing the same format que, que, que everywhere sí, else? Que, que uh, we somehow know tema. that the answer is yes, but uh, <laughs> where are you right now? No, um, it's um, I personally uh, don't own Scum. Uh, NRK is the broadcaster that owns this um, this format, uh, and it has been sold to the United States and also some countries in Europe. Uh, so uh, we are really excited to see how that turns out. Yes. Okay. Okay. Están en eso. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfecto. Okay, bueno, perfect. Now we open si the floor to questions from the audience, maybe. Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Eh, la serie, la As regards es, uh, the si series, my question is: in, el, eh, en la in, la serie, in the de narrative construction of the series, el, el feed, do you take into account the feedback fans, from sí. the fans? Y, Agregando ahí a una segunda pregunta muy And corta. a second brief question. Teniendo en cuenta la repercusión internacional. Taking into account serie, the international reaction, how do you perceive ejemplo, these cultural issues like the, the tra this tradition bus, with the bus? Uh, you mentioned that eh, the beginning for graduation. Uh, how si does that play a, a role a in the international level if there's eh, any loss of uh, traditions? How do you perceive the evolution of that content? Well, um, I can start by answering the last question. I don't know uh, how um, the, the countries who will do remakes, I don't know, it's up to them how they solve that. But for us, we, don't, we didn't care about that at all because our mission was to make a show for 16-year-old girls in Norway. So even though international fans started to watching in, uh, we always went back to the mission mission statement, which is making something for them. And also, NRK is not a, a commercial broadcaster. It doesn't profit. It's, it's paid by uh, true taxes uh, from Norwegian people, and that's what we get money to do, to make something for Norwegian people. Um, in terms of the storyline, we can do small changes. Um, I would never change I would never change uh, a character's journey uh, after reading reactions from fans, but uh, there has been times where I've uh, seen that fans are on to me, that they are, they know where I'm going with the story, so I'll make little twists to surprise them. Uh, so I, yes, I use the feedback, but. Uh, but it doesn't... The main storylines are yeah. written long bef or before we start shooting. Before we start writing and shooting. Oh. I'll, write, uh, I'll write a show during uh, the season, but I've already written the, the, the character's journey and the, 
the arc storyline uh, for the season before the season starts, and I'll, I'll I never change that. Bien. Otra pregunta. Okay. Another question. ¿Qué tal? Buenas tardes. Eh, para Good afternoon. Con mi novia hace mucho que conocemos Scam. Together with my girlfriend, uh, we're familiar with Scam for a long time, so it's a pleasure having you here. At some point in the conversation, the characters were replying one each other, and you said that when the show became so popular, you could no longer do that. The question is, what did you stop doing when the show became popular, and what did you start doing when it became so popular? Uh, well, we stopped doing it because it's 2,000 comments so, under. A so it would just drown. <laughs> we couldn't. We couldn't. And like also, it was like challenge, 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 challenge ourselves challenge. Uh, to like be creative and find new ways. I think it would be boring if we would do all the same stuff all the time. Uh, and I think it's more exciting for our audience when when they are like. Um, when we give them new uh, stuff in a new way, it's just um, they and they do. There sometimes yeah. they will comment on each other's pictures. Yeah, but that was like a full conversation done in the comment yeah. field, and that's much more harder to do now because you will have 300 comments in between the characters' yeah. comments, so you lose the but you lose you, the story. Have we stopped with anything since it became so? No. No. I don't think so. No. I don't think... No? No. Didn't stop. Okay. <laughs> Bien. Siguiente. Okay, next question. Hola, sí. Um, sobre el final de la serie... Acá. Sobre el final de la serie, Scam rompe su formato y rompe un poco su... At, at the end of the series, it breaks the format and kind of the rules to strengthen the message that each character had its own journey, its own difficulties, and the fact that their decisions influenced all the others. Is that finally linked to the fact that uh, elections are coming closer in uh, Norway and there's a great concern for political apathy in teenagers and does that have to do with the message of making it a political agency, um, turning teenagers into political um, agency and if this is owing to the fact that it comes from the state, scam, I mean. I, I really want to answer a yes to that because that sounded really smart. Yeah. If, I, <laughs> <laughs> but it's if I thought about all that writing the last episode, that would like be great. But no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, but yeah, but you could, I guess you could from now on, I'm going to try to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that, actually. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start saying that. Well, but it's not propaganda. Like you try, no, you're you not trying to <laughs> give our audience one but view uh, of the politics. Like, like a confidence boost or something to be more political. No, I think uh, for me the last episode uh, was... Was uh, it may have some politics in it, but it wasn't. It's more about being nice to the people around you and and to make people um, uh, realize that we are all depending on each other, uh, and that yes, in politics also. But and, yeah, and that love wins in the end. It doesn't always win, but that's <laughs> yeah. that it, that it should. It should win. Hola, Julie and Mary, ¿cómo están? Hi, Julie, Mary. I was lucky to talk to you over these days, so I know there are many stories in SCAM you're not telling us here, so in terms of political participation, I would like to you to tell us about the diplomatic incident you almost caused with Denmark with the oh, minister yeah. involved. <laughs> yeah, because um, we uh, would love a scum uh, in the first and second season were open to the whole world. The, the because page. no one cared about us like, Nobody in the cared. system. And no. we use, you know, 
use a lot of music. Yeah, and we Expensive have rights music. to use that music in Norway, uh, which is great. Uh, but but then when all people from all over the world started watching in, uh, the uh, the music industry got really mad and said, "You have you have to close it because your people are, yeah." I don't know why they were mad, but the <laughs> people are because enjoying music, music so close it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, but it's music rights. Uh, anyway, we had to close it, but then Denmark, which was all of Denmark, was a real huge fans of this yeah. show. They were the first international audience yeah. in Denmark. Um, so they got really upset. So the cultural minister of Denmark called the cultural minister of Norway <laughs> to get them to open the page for Denmark, and it in happened. In the middle of the election in Denmark. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and we did, we opened it for Sweden and Denmark. They did all the deals with, um, with the music industry. Yeah. yeah. Bien. Uh, <clears throat> I have a question about uh, the age of your audience. It's uh, very interesting to focus on 16-year-olds but unfortunately, the following year, there are 17-year-old, and then 18, and so on. And you should be gaining new audiences. How do you manage to keep, I hope so, the audience you have, for instance, this year, as the audience grows up, if you still appeal to 16-year-old people? Yeah, well... It doesn't really, I don't think, I think if you look at the American teen shows, some of the most popular shows for 16 year olds are played by 20 year olds and also are, the characters are 20 year old. You don't have to be, have 16 year old characters to, to reach that target group. Uh, so we were only, uh, we were making sure that all the teams and the stories uh, were rooted in what we knew that 16-year-old girls um, was uh, uh, concerned about. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't really matter to us if the characters grow old. I don't think that the show would have... Or this is what I think w uh, would have happened. If it... If it uh, the the um, series were going beyond season six, which is the last uh, semester in high school. I think it probably would have started over with a new, uh, maybe somebody's little sister or something, just to uh, kind of don't follow them to college. But I don't think it's a rule that you can't tell stories for 16-year-olds about 18-year-olds. Yeah. Okay, so... Wait, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm talking here, like, I'm raising my hand. Okay. So I have a question um, about the actors that, that play these characters. Does they, uh, do they uh, like interact in social media with, uh, with what, do they become uh, these characters? Do they do, they do some... Uh, yeah, we understand. I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so but I, I don't know how to put it. Uh, so no, that you can if they, if they, yeah, if the if the actors are administrating the yes, yeah. no, not all the content, but do they put ideas on the table yeah. and things like well, that? Well, um, they don't. Uh, uh, are controlling the accounts. Uh, it's me actually, who runs all the accounts and. Um, but they come with ideas. They can come with ideas, and they were like really good to uh, co uh, corrigere. Yeah, correct, correct, us. correct us, us all the time. When we are like when or when I have used uh, a caption or like just an emoji that is just lame, I would get a text from one of the actors on Mari, you have to delete that. You have to change it. It's just <laughs> loose, <laughs> not being cool. lame, not yeah. cool. Or if like you use slang in the wrong way. I don't group. use slang in the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> I never do that. Why are you saying? If they will correct us. Yeah, yeah. Come. They correct us all the time and yeah. we ask them all the time, what, what? do you want? Yeah. I, I ask them, what kind of scene do you want to make this season and what do you want to, what, what do you want us to, yeah. 
yeah. to do. So they are very involved in with the, the show, but they never publish anything and they don't have the final say in anything. One more, One more question. Sí, acá. Sí. Yes, here. Um, He visto muchas historias I have seen many stories, many teenage stories para adolescentes. for teenagers. Y By teenagers, for teenagers. No But here I don't see any evil stepmother or any condescending father or any harassing adult world or any Cinderella which, uh, who for a second marriage uh, gets to play a horrible uh, role in the second family. And with this, what I mean is no that I think you did not fall in common places of a es, teenage stories for teenagers. And I think the word that could best describe, jóvenes, uh, apart from the fact that you have well uh, captured consumption habits of uh, teens, is that you have no? been honest in the writing, in the narrative. Thank you. Was that a question? No. ¿Creen que la palabra honestidad define the term honesty can define oh, yeah, yeah. partly the success of the product? Yeah, definitely. I think, and that's also something we found during the research is that 16-year-olds can handle most anything. Like you can talk to them about almost anything and and they really appreciate it because they're at the age where they're they are between being kids and going on to be adults so they really like it when you when you um overestimate them just a bit because it builds their confidence in a way so that's also a reason why we didn't have parents also because I think it's really boring writing scenes with parents, but uh, <laughs> more importantly, uh, I think that we wanted to build their confidence that they could solve the problems themselves uh, and that they are, um, we wanted to uh, project them or mirror them as funny and smart and intellectual. Bien, vamos a ir ya cerrando. Ok, ahora vamos a cerrar este panel. Me parece que también hay algo que deja scam para la industria audiovisual. Scam leaves many things for the audiovisual. Something that is really clear for the ones in this industry. And this is a model that Maybe if we change the story, it shows how to work the engagement with the audience and how to dialogue with the audience. This content creation real time with the prior research and that dialogue can be transported to other stories and formats. And this is something you have also created. Are you aware of this? Are you already thinking of other stories using this? The same work structure? Yeah, well, I think both of us would love to keep on, because this, this goes all the way back to 2008. I worked with the first show, so I've been working with this kind of formats for 10 years. Um, and I don't think it's not like, I don't know if I'm going to do that for the rest of my life, but right now I think it's really exciting exploring what could be next in this kind of... And I think both of us love yeah. working, even though it's exhausting, but, but working in a season where um, it feels like an event yeah. and you have to it's perform. It's really rewarding. Yeah. yeah. And so it's fun. Sí, y probablemente así como los fans toman el contenido, just la like industria toma el modelo. Just like fans took ownership of the content, maybe the industry will take your model. Are you aware of this? Maybe the industry will take this model and replicate it with yeah. the system. Let them yeah. try. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <But> yeah. <laughs> okay, we should stop. No, uh, I'm joking. <laughs> but, uh, no, but uh, I think scum can, uh, could have been told in so many ways. Like, this is not the only way. 
I'm no. sure of it. And it's also... And it's, yeah, there's so many possibilities to create these kind of experience, the real-time experience or like the interaction with the characters. So... Yeah, and also I think every time like like we have developed this kind of format for many years. It it's not given that scum the way it's told the past two years will work next year. Oh. So it's not it's in constant change. Mm -hmm. But I think I would I love and welcome every new form of telling a story. Bring them. Yeah, bring it. Bien, a ver una pregunta más. Okay, we'll be taking one more question sí. here. Um, you've said the main target to um, the show had was 16-year-old girls and to conserve that target through the years. But there's something I don't, una I don't understand, that eventually the girls who follow the show will grow, and even if the, in the first season they were 16, in the fourth season they will be uh, 20. So how do you adapt the show for them not to lose interest in it? Yeah, um, it's, um, well, we have two seasons a year, so they will be 16 and then 17 in season three and four and then 18. Uh, and as I said earlier, I don't think you have to, I don't think the characters have to be 16 for you to tell stories to 16 year olds. It's, it's two different things. The one thing is the target group and, and what kind of stories you choose to tell for that group. The other thing is how old the characters are, but I believe you can tell stories for 16-year-olds with a 50-year-old character. Yeah. I wouldn't like to try that, but I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think you could do it. No, but you see what I mean? It, does, it doesn't necessarily have to mean anything. Uh, the, the thing is, um, we just focused on being true on the research we found within the 16-year-olds and then always going back to that and making sure that um, we were telling the story for them even if the character was 18. Yeah, and in some way, I think, uh, like, teenagers, they want to look up to someone that is maybe a couple of years older. So we had a lot of audience that were... 14 and 15 because they are like want to learn how it is yeah. to be 16 or so it's more exciting to see something and it feels yeah something a bit yeah usually really in television you would or you aim would, higher than yeah them. you would have a 18 year old probably to to reach 16 year olds because you always look up yeah bueno no sé si será un buen síntoma okay, o qué. Ok, I don't know if tiempo, this is a good sign or what, but whenever I need to announce that the panel is over, I feel sorry because I would have liked to talk for an hour with Naomi, the same with you, but there are other conferences which are as good as yours, and I'm sorry to tell you. Thank you very much. I'll be in Uruguay, but thank you for being here with us.